Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. We have dealt with the subject numerous times about how the Bible is to be read, how the Bible is to be understood. One of the things that we keep coming up against by those who like to claim to follow the Bible, at least in some regards, claim support from the Bible for their agendas, is that they don't really come to the Bible seeking to be changed by it. We've talked about a whole host of folks. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we talked about President Obama invoking the name of Jesus, invoking a Bible reference to support his proposal for higher taxes on the rich. We dealt with that. Uh, he doesn't seem to care what the context is. He doesn't seem to care uh, about the rest of what the Bible says. The problem that we hear all the time from people is, well, you have to deal with the Bible understanding that it's full of contradictions. Now we've had people call in over the years offering their contradictions, and we've yet to hear anything substantive. I want to talk about some that you will run into, some that we have heard in the past, some that we uh, can find out on the internet. You can go to the atheist sites and you can actually see what they put forward. The, the most virulent opponents of the Bible, what do they say are the things that should cause us not to believe the Bible and to reject it out of hand? This is not only something we hear from atheists, it's something we hear from LDS often. Uh, not all LDS, but the LDS Articles of Faith say that they believe the Bible insofar as it is correctly translated. Now, that doesn't get nailed down. Uh, very clearly, because then it would be an easier target. You see, the issue is not just a matter of translating from the original Hebrew and Greek. The issue gets brought in in terms of uh, passing along uh, the correct uh, information in those original manuscripts. Uh, it comes down to whether you have authority. There are a whole host of other things. The reality is that very few LDS seem to view the Bible as a challenge when it contradicts them. They just dismiss it. Because what is taught in the other standard works is supposed to trump this. Wherever the Bible disagrees with them, it must be wrong. I've heard from countless uh, LDS, LDS missionaries and others over the years, how the Bible supposedly contradicts itself. We're going to look at some of the ones that are the more common, but we're going to do something a little different. If you believe that the Bible contradicts itself, we challenge you. Call in. I don't pretend to have answers to all the various criticisms that have been put forward. I do not have an encyclopedic knowledge of the Bible that I can simply pull an answer for every possible question. But if you have a question that I can't deal with this evening, I will come back next week and, Lord willing, I will have an answer for you. I have dealt with more objections than I can imagine over the years. The reality is the Bible stands the test. The problem is that people come to the Bible with a set of expectations, and if the Bible doesn't meet their arbitrary expectations, then they say it must be rejected. One of those expectations is that the Bible must be written in the way that I want it to be written. There's a failure to recognize that in any communication, there is context, there are 
figures of speech. There are all kinds of other things. It doesn't mean that there's not real communication taking place. But it does mean that we don't say that things have to mean what we want them to mean or they have to be rejected. Let me give you an example. There's a classic cartoon from 1951 by Tex Avery. We've got a few uh, screenshots from the, uh, from the thing. You can actually watch it online. It's, it's called Symphony and Slang. And in this little cartoon, the, the running gag through the seven minute cartoon is that there's this difficulty understanding what this guy is saying because he's using slang. One of the things that he describes is that he made a living punching cattle. And here's the image that uh, immediately came to mind to the people who were hearing him. Hopefully we have that graphic working now. It's the one for punching cattle. There he is. Uh, it's a term that we use about uh, being a cowboy. It's not literally punching cattle as shown here. Uh, another one. He's trying to describe his, his story of his life. He says that this man drew a gun on him. And here's the image that goes with that. He drew a gun on him. We're having some technical challenges tonight. My apologies. There we go. It's not exactly what we would expect, but it is a literal interpretation of what the man is saying. He talks about meeting a girl. He says, our eyes met. And here's the image that goes with that. We're having some problems. Don't. Um, and then there was another one where he said he's all thumbs. And it shows a, the one with um, where it says our eyes met. Literally, the eyes pop out and meet in between. Uh, he says that uh, he was all thumbs, and it shows his hands, and they're just all thumbs. It's a literalistic interpretation of what the man's saying. Now, is that what he was literally saying? No. Was what he was saying unintelligible? No. But when we force arbitrary constraints on language, um, it's ridiculous. But that's what people do to the Bible. Let me give you a better example. In the English language, we talk about love. I love my dog. I love a sports team. I love my wife. I love God. The way that some people come to the Bible, they would insist that if I'm using the term love, it must mean exactly the same thing every time. And supposedly my affection for my wife, for my children, for God, it must be identical to my affection for my dog. But that's not the way we talk. That's not the way we communicate. When we come to the Bible, rather than, than saying, well, this isn't, you know, this is, this is um, not strictly according to my standards, as we're going to see, we need to let it speak for itself, and we need to deal with the big issues. But that's not what people typically do. Instead, people come and they look for excuses. Now, I've heard the same thing from many LDS over the years. Well, then you shouldn't take the Book of Mormon that way. And I honestly agree. Uh, elder in our church, uh, I love the way he puts it. He says, you know, in terms of, uh, I forget the Book of um, this address in the Book of Mormon dealing, uh, it ends with adieu, you know, the French word for goodbye. Is that, is that something that should be the basis of us rejecting the Book of Mormon? No. There are a whole host of more substantive issues. And the Bible puts forth very serious claims of history, very serious claims about the nature of God, do those things contradict one another, or is it that people don't like what it says and they try to pit things against each other? We invite you to call in. If you believe the Bible contradicts itself, give us a call. We want to hear from you tonight. 
I, I, I hear this from people all the time, and yet in terms of actually putting forth solid examples, very few seem to be able to put forth many. But we're going to look at some. Uh, some of these you'll run into uh, from LDS apologists. Some of them uh, you'll run into from atheists, and you run into them in a whole host of other settings as well. But let's look at one that was put forward to young man uh, came up to our book table at the University of Utah. He was raised Southern Baptist. He was meeting with the LDS missionaries. And he was, he knew a little bit about the Bible. And they're putting forth things to him. And he says, well, do, you know, doesn't the Bible say something like this against that? And they said, well, you gotta remember, the Bible contradicts itself. And the example they gave him was they compared Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, with James 2, 24. And we'll look at that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now that seems very clear, the next, but then they, you compare it to James 2, 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. And essentially at that point, they closed their Bibles and you said, you see, you can't trust the Bible. Because Paul is saying that a man is um, saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. James seems to be saying that a man is, um, is justified by works and not by faith only. Well, obviously, this must contradict, right? You'll hear this from PhD um, people on History Channel things where they say, well, obviously, James was aware of Paul's gospel and didn't like it. And he's making that very clear. The problem is the people don't actually bother to read context. A passage like this was put forward uh, just yesterday on one of the uh, radio programs to Every Man and Answer, a lady called in and wanted to know what Jesus meant in Matthew 6 when it says, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will God forgive you yours. How do you make sense of that? Isn't it all of grace? And I think that it's, it's somewhat understandable that this is a confusing passage or confusing um, situation here when so many people don't seem to understand the nature of salvation. Unfortunately, on this program, you had two pastors saying, well, this is honestly one of the tough passages of Scripture. Only if you have this cheap view of grace. The reality is that if you don't forgive people their trespasses, you show that you haven't, if you can't give mercy, you show that you haven't received mercy. Now, it's not by giving mercy that you receive mercy. That's made very clear. But when you are born again, when you are changed, the Holy Spirit indwells you. There is fruit of the Spirit. It's not that we are saved by our works, but we are saved to good works. When I asked this young man is, I said, did you bother reading the context of either one of these passages? And he looked at me like, what? You know, he, he didn't even understand the context, uh, concept of looking at context. He was a college student. He was a bright young man, but he had never been taught to read the Bible. Most people seem to come to the Bible as if it's this, this jumble of, of random sayings and stories that, don't, that aren't, aren't expected to make sense. But that's not the case. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it's a letter. It's, it, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has a flow to it. What I pointed out to him is that in contrast to what the missionaries were uh, leading him to believe, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is not putting forward this idea that works are somehow divorced from grace. Because the very next ver verse in Ephesians chapter 2, it's, remember 
8 and 9 say, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The very next verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God uh, hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul was not saying that you can have Jesus as your Savior, but not, uh, uh, but not have to have him as Lord. That somehow or another you can, you can get fire insurance and then you can look, go live like a pagan. He's making very clear, we are saved by grace alone, not by anything we do. It's not by works. Even the faith that we have is a gift of God. There's, we, don't, we don't climb a ladder. We don't, we don't uh, try our best. You know, uh, it's not salvation by grace after all we can do. It is solely by grace. But when we, who deserved hell as much as anyone, have been brought to faith in Jesus Christ, when God saves us in our sins, he also saves us from our sins. Paul asked the question in Romans 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who have died to sin live any longer therein? Now, yes, there's the continuing battle in Romans chapter 7. But we can't live like we used to. The issue here in Ephesians 2 is Paul was making very clear, it is not by works that we are saved. The very next, very next verse after the one that they read makes clear, though, that we are saved to good works. And that's the problem that James is dealing with. James says, you have faith without works? You show me your faith without works, and I, without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. He says, faith without works is dead. Paul and James are dealing with, very, with, with different issues, but they're saying the same thing. Paul is dealing with people who are tempted to say, well, I'm going to be right with God because I'm going to show God what a good person I am. I'm going to show him that I can merit the merit of Christ. I'm, I'm going to prove my worthiness for exaltation. Paul says, no. It's not of works. It's grace from beginning to end. As he says to the Corinthians, the natural man is at enmity with God. The natural man can do nothing to please God. We are dead, Ephesians 2, in our trespasses and sins. We're not sick, we're dead. It's God who's made us alive. It's God who has given us eyes to see and ears to hear, who has quickened us, made us alive in Christ. We're not saved by repentance plus faith. But every true faith is accompanied by repentance. John, we, we dealt with this uh, several weeks ago. The first epistle of John, he makes very clear, God is light. And if you say you have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, not stumbling into the darkness, but walking in the darkness, you're living in darkness, you're deceived. You're a liar. You don't have fellowship with God. If you say that you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. How do we know that we love God? We keep his commandments. It's not that we are somehow meriting Christ, that somehow we do all these things and then we're born again. No, when we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells us and then we can't, we can't live like we used to live. This isn't a contradiction. The same Paul who says that it's not of works lest any man should boast. The very next passage, very next line, sentence, says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So this is not a contradiction. If you think it is, please call in. But this is one that I... Um, that. LDS missionaries were telling this young man was the basis on which he should reject the Bible. Let's look at another one. Um, this is one that I've heard in a number of contexts. Uh, Van Hale loves this one because uh, he's the host of Mormon Miscellaneous. Uh, he used this in a debate with me. 
I tried to give him an answer to it. He did not like that answer. But um, I think that all we have to do is look at Scripture to see that it's not a contradiction. Before we go, go into this, I want to encourage you. If you believe the Bible contradicts itself, call in. If you don't call in, then you have absolutely no excuse for rejecting the Bible and what it says. My contention uh, throughout this program has been that the Bible is clear. It's not, it's not clear in every part, but what's not so clear in one part is understood in the context of the rest of it. The Bible says there is no God. Now the context says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. There are things that honestly we come to in Scripture and we say, well, I'm not quite sure what exactly that particular part is saying. But the rest of Scripture is clear and it makes very clear it's not all this strange stuff that people like to impose on it. People love to find an obscure passage, something that's not so clear, and they impose a meaning on it and they ignore all the rest of what the Bible says. When do we do that in any other form of communication? Unless you're a teenager and you're upset with your parents. You know, then they'll focus on one statement you made completely out of context. But you said, but you said, but you said. That's sort of the way people deal with the Bible. At any rate, let's look at another one. This is one Van Hale loves. In 2 Samuel uh, 24, uh, verse 1. It says that God moved David to take a census of Israel and that this is a sinful act for which he judges him. Okay, So who is it that moves David? It's God because he's angry with him. David had already sinned and it's God who moves him or stirs him up to do this. First Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1 says that it's Satan who moves David to number the people. Van Hale says it's a contradiction. You can't have God doing something and Satan doing something and it both be true. I think this points out the problem that Van Hale and I have different gods. His God is a Superman. Um, I'm not saying that to be mean to him. It's, it's something that we've debated. It's something we've discussed. I think it's clear to both of us. We are talking about radically different beings. His God cannot have anything to do with Satan. But the God of the Bible is the God who is God over the whole universe. The one whom Jesus said not a sparrow can fall outside of his will. He's the God who says... Uh, when there's a calamity in the city, is it not I who've caused it? He is the one who is described over and over, ruling over everything. Well, how does, how does evil fit in? Well, let's, let's look at Genesis. De, uh, Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. Why did they do that? Because they hated him. Were they nice guys and God made them hate their brother? No, they hated him freely. And yet, what is Joseph able to say after, after this great salvation comes about? Where he ends up going into Egypt, he's falsely accused, he's put into prison, eventually he is called on to interpret Pharaoh's dream. He's made second in the kingdom. His brothers come. You know, this wonderful story. Joseph's brothers are terrified when they find out it's him. It's payback time, they think. And so they go to him and say, Our father said, you know, not to hold this against us. Joseph looks at him and he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. To bring about this salvation. Over and over in Scripture we see that God uses evil for His purposes. He's not the author of evil. 
He's not to blame for evil. But when, when Satan comes wanting to afflict Job, what does he have to do? He has to get permission. And God limits what he can do. People have this, this weird idea of Satan somehow being this, this um, great opposing force to God that you know, God is desperately trying to do what he can. But Satan, you know, um, God's going to win in the end, but Satan, uh, Satan is supposedly uh, able to thwart God. Wrong. Over and over we see that God uses even evil for his purposes. doesn't mean that he's the author of it. When he hardened Pharaoh's heart, where he would not let Israel go. The picture there is not that Pharaoh really wanted to do good and God is dragging him, kicking and screaming, saying, no, 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 I don't want to be a bad man. The picture over and over, Romans 1 is a great example of this, God gives people over to the sin that's within them. They do what they want to do. And so they're guilty, and yet at the same time, God brings about his purposes. The greatest example, of course, is the greatest evil that was ever perpetrated in human history, the crucifixion. The one time that we had God within our grasp, we nailed him to a cross. Peter makes very clear in the Pentecost sermon in Acts 2 that, this is, that they took Jesus with sinful hands, They are responsible for what they've done. And yet, Peter also makes clear, it is according to the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. God purposed that this would happen. You see, this isn't a contradiction here in 2 Samuel and um, 1 Chronicles. There's not some contradiction here that, you know, this is some mishmash of stories and that um, somebody over here says, well, you know, I think God did it. No, no, no. God didn't have anything to do with it. No, Satan did it. Wrong. The only way you have a problem with God being in charge of what Satan does is if your God is too small. And yet I have heard this over and over. Van Hale even with this kind of explanation, Van Halen says, no, it's a contradiction. No, it's a contradiction. Well, let's hear from you tonight. If you believe the Bible contradicts itself, let's hear from you. The phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. We're talking about the Bible. Does it contradict itself? All right, here's another one. This, I think they must have taught this years ago uh, a lot down at the Missionary Training Center because I used to hear it a great deal from LDS missionaries. Uh, I have not heard it in several years, so it seems as if, honestly, it seems as if many of the uh, old approaches have been jettisoned. Um, many of the missionaries I hear today simply say, well, we're, we're not, you know, we're young men. We really don't know that much. We're just here to share. Um, those weren't the missionaries I used to know. I mean, they, they claimed they knew the truth. They were coming with authority and they, you know, they were ready to take on all comers. But um, in Acts chapter 9, verse 7, it says that the, um, this is talking about Paul's uh, conversion. It says, And the men uh, which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. That's Acts 9, 7. Later on, same book, and they that were with me, this is Paul speaking uh, directly, giving his testimony, uh, saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Now when you read that in the King James Version, which is a good translation, it's a, it's a, it's a um, it's a very good translation. It's not perfect, but it's very good. When you read that, 
if you have no concept of translation or things like this, uh, you, there's a temptation to say, well, obviously it contradicts. Here's the problem. You're reading it in English. Now, can the Bible be understood in its English translation? Yeah. Honestly, almost all the supposed issues can be dealt with without ever resorting to the original languages. But, but once in a while, it's helpful to go back and look at the original languages to see, is this translation that, that we have making very clear what's going on here? The problem with the King James in this sense is um, it's giving a good translation. But the Greek that lies behind it is different. It's the same verb. Uh, it's a kuo in, uh, in Greek. And any Greek, uh, native Greek speakers can fuss at me later about my pronunciation of Greek. But um, what they would, what they can tell you though is that words change according to the way they are used. Just like in English, we have words sometimes that they vary according to context. No, I, you know, I don't love God in the same way I love my dog. I don't love my wife in the same way I love my dog or, my, or you know, the Atlanta Braves or something like that. That's understood. But sometimes the construction affects things, especially in Greek. In the uh, first instance, in chapter 9, verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 7, you have a kuo uh, being used with the genitive. In chapter 22, verse 9, you have it being used with the accusative. And so, in some of the translations, to bring out the nuances there, it's made clear that the latter one is not that they didn't hear anything, it's that they didn't hear with understanding. And that's a very different thing. And so um, it's what, it, it coincides with what we see in chapter 9, that they heard a voice um, and they saw no man. They heard a voice, but they, what's made clear here is they didn't understand what was being said. So they hear a voice, but they don't, under, they don't hear with understanding. And so the whole problem is based on people reading the, the King James and, and trying to pit one passage against the other and, and not, not looking at context, not looking at the original languages. We're going to go ahead and open up our phone lines. Uh, we're going to go first to Laura from Sandy. Uh, Laura, good to have you with us. Hello. You're on the air. I can't bear to hear you, but... You're on the I air. do have a question, okay. or not a question. I used to be LDS, and uh, I was talking with a friend, trying to explain how to believe in the Trinity, how to believe God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit of one. And he brought up the argument about Stephen, one who was out telling, I'm looking for it right now, but he was out it's telling Acts, the people Acts chapter seven. about uh, Jesus, and they were stoning him. Then he looked into the sky and saw him at the right and hand he of saw God. Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Mm -hmm. And he used that argument, and I, I couldn't think of anything to argue back uh, about it. So I was wondering if you could explain that. Sure. Thank you for your call. I'll, I'm going to take it off here because we apparently have a few problems with the reception. But yeah, this is, this is a classic thing. LDS. Like, like Van Hale had this idea that God could have nothing to do with, with Satan. It's because he has a messed up view of God that he has this, this issue. Similarly, uh, Acts chapter 7 talks about Stephen seeing, as he's being stoned, uh, he, he looks and he sees heavens open. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Well, LDS tend to think of the Trinity as... Um, a, a form of modalism. It's an, it's an old heresy. It's the idea that you have one God who is portraying himself at times as Father, portraying himself sometimes as Son, portraying himself sometimes as a Spirit. 
and that there's only one God and he's just playing different roles. That's modalism. That seems to be what Joseph Smith thought the Trinity was. And so when you have, and, and if, you, if you think that that's what the Trinity is supposed to be, and you see that there is a distinction between the Father and the Son, then you say, well, obviously the Trinity can't be true. Some other passages that people will use in this regard is um, when Jesus is praying to the Father. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, was he praying to himself? You have to understand, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses take a different tact. Uh, they believe that there's one God, but only the Father. They believe that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. He's not, he's, uh, he's not truly God. He's a little G God. And that's a whole other story we won't go into. The Bible makes very clear there is one God. And that is made in, in Deuteronomy 6. Uh, it is made, Jesus repeats that over and over, Isaiah 43, 10, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45. You read all through there. Over and over, there is only one God. God knows of no other. Before me there was no God for him, neither shall there be after me. That's Isaiah 43, 10. You have all these passages saying in, in the starkest possible terms, that there is one God, and yet the Father is portrayed as God, the Son is portrayed as God, and the Holy Spirit is portrayed as God. And it's made clear, and this is how Athanasius uh, tried to articulate it in the uh, fourth century, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, and yet they are one God. Now how do we understand that? Because we see, like in the Gospel of John, Jesus uh, is, uh, tells his disciples things that kind of frustrate them. Philip says, uh, I forget the reference on this offhand, but Philip says, in, in exasperation, says, show us the Father, and that is sufficient for us. And Jesus says, Philip, have you, known, have you been with me this long and you don't know me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And yet there's a clear distinction. The Gospel of John begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, so there's a distinction. It's like Jesus standing at the right hand of God. There is a distinction. The Word was with God. And then the very next verse, and the, uh, and the Word was God. So there's an identity as well. How do we understand these things? We are finite little creatures of dust and ashes. The God who portrays himself in Scripture is the one who, who the heavens of heavens cannot contain. He is bigger than the universe because it's just his creation. He is beyond our conception. He says, as the heavens are high above the earth, so are his ways above ours. We should not expect that God is going to somehow fit into our little box of understanding. Solomon, when he builds his temple, says that the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built for thee. So we see that there is a distinction in the persons, and yet even in the, the Gospels, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In Colossians, we're told, uh, in end of chapter 1, beginning of chapter 2, in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness, not just a third, not just um, some part of it. All the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ. Philippians 2, who being in the very form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God. And yet he humbled himself and came in the form of a servant. These things don't contradict. What is made clear is that there is one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. They're not the same, and yet they are one God. They're not parts of Him. This is a relationship beyond our understanding. And yet it is clearly taught throughout Scripture. It is indicated in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, you, can, you can read the commentaries of the early church fathers. They, they saw the Trinity everywhere. I mean, from, uh, Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy. You know, it's, it's this... Um, they see 
the connection there. Who is it that Isaiah sees there on that throne? It's in John chapter 12, it says, it's Jesus. So there are things that we don't understand. They are beyond our whole frame of reference. And yet when they are clearly taught, uh, we accept them for what they say. So the Bible doesn't contradict itself in that regard. But anyway, that's a quick thumbnail sketch. I hope that makes sense. We're going to go to Peggy uh, in Logan. Peggy, good to have you with us. Peggy? Hello, Peggy. Peggy, if you, I, I think I hear something. If you can hear me, please pick up. It seems like we may have lost Peggy. Um, if you want to call back, we'll get you on the air. Um, we have with us uh, Rayanne from West Jordan. Rayanne, good to have you with us. Thank you. I enjoy your program very much. Thank you. Um, I'm a, I don't really have a question. Um, I was, I'm a 60-year-old woman, and I was a member of the Mormon Church for 40 years. And for the last 10 years, I have uh, become a Christian and have uh, studied the Bible. And I think this is going back to your previous subject of uh, works without, uh, faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. um, I talk a lot about this to Mormon people, and I, something that has helped me when I explain it to them is that now that I am a Christian and I've studied the Bible, God changed my heart, and I have faith that I will be with Him after I die. So because of that faith and that He has changed my heart, and I know that I'll be with Him, I, my natural progression is to do good works. The faith is what's required, but because I had my change of heart because of my faith, then I'm naturally going to want to do good things. Yeah. And when and I explain it to people that way, they seem to understand it better. And another thing is that, they, uh, that you mentioned was something about the devil. And the devil knows full well that uh, he can only do what God allows him to do. But the reason he, and he knows he's going to lo lose in the end. But his goal is to take as many people down with him as he can. So um, just those few things have helped me explain things to Mormons. Uh, I didn't yeah. really have a question, just wanted okay. to comment. I appreciate it. If you'd like to yeah. join, thank you for calling. If you'd like to join in the conversation, the phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. My great frustration in dealing with people across the spectrum in modern America can really be summed up in one big thing. Hardly anyone knows anything about the Bible. Even people who claim to be Christians seem to know very, very little about the Bible anymore. Uh, honestly, this is one of the things that I think is a stumbling block for many LDS is because many people who uh, profess to be evangelicals in the state seem to know very little about the Bible. That's, that's not everybody, but I mean a lot of people. I had a youth leader one time uh, telling me when I was uh, citing what the Bible said, she said, well, you don't actually think that God intends us to keep that, do you? It was from 1 John. I'm sorry, uh, it was from um, the qualifications for elders in um, 1 Timothy. And, uh, and it was in Titus 1. And she said, well, you don't think that God actually intends us to keep that, do you? And I said, yeah. First John, chapter 2, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. How can a child of God who loves God just completely disregard his commands? Now, none of us are perfect, but there's a huge difference between stumbling and being convicted and corrected and shown the way of escape. There's a very big difference between a child of God struggling with sin and someone just saying, I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's not a child of God. You don't have the Holy Spirit within you when you just laugh at Him 
when you shake your fist and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, people talk about the Bible all the time. I hear atheists talk about the Bible. I hear LDS talk about the Bible. But you start asking basic questions. And hardly anyone knows anything. I've, I've shared before, we, we, we do book tables a lot. And I used to try to answer people when they would come up and ask questions about, well, what, what about the Gnostic Gospels? What about the Nag Hammadi Library and the and Dead Sea Scrolls and this and that and the other, and all, or all this esoteric stuff? Dead Sea Scrolls, some of it's just straightforward scriptures. Uh, some of it's writings from the Essenes, and it's a whole other story. But it's all the stuff other than the Bible. And I used to actually try to quickly answer their questions. Instead, I found out the best thing to do is ask them very basic questions about the Bible. Because they're so convinced that there's, so, there's all this truth somewhere else, and they've never bothered to study it. I have people tell me all the time, well, I study the Bible. I know the Bible. So, really? Uh, who wrote First Timothy? Well, I'm not a Bible scholar. I mean, I'm just asking you, who wrote the letter? Who wrote Titus? They go, Titus? Said, no. I asked them big picture questions. You watch, you know, this, this, I think um, it, it's, it's telling when we, when we watch Jeopardy of all shows. You can have people on there that they can rattle off some of the most obscure details of the most obscure plays written by Henrik Ibsen. They can rattle off various scientific information. And yet, almost inevitably, the last category picked, if it's on there, is the Bible. And the most basic Bible questions give them problems. About 20 years ago, they had the top three students who had taken a, um, a standardized test in France. Top three high school students in the entire country of France. Not one of them could name the members of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, whichever you want to pick, um, in French or whatever. They couldn't name it. In this country, they did a survey of high school seniors and they asked them the question. They asked them very basic questions. Name the four Gospels. How many disciples did Jesus have? Or what event is celebrated by Easter? 80% could not answer any of the three questions. I asked people, can you name the Ten Commandments? It doesn't have to be word perfect. It doesn't have to be in order. Can you just name them? Everybody's confident they can until they start. I can't think of anyone off the street that I've ever found that could name more than four. Almighty God gave this directly. You know, it's, 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 the, it's this huge event in Scripture, and people who think they know the Bible, they can't name the Ten Commandments? What does that say about the rest of the Bible? My, my reason for doing all this, read the Bible for what it says. Don't take my word for things. Read the Bible. Simply do what it says. That's all I ask. We're going to go to Peggy, uh, who's back with us. Peggy, good to have you with us. Hello. We seem to be having problems getting Peggy on the line. Peggy? Hello, Peggy. Sorry, there's some, uh, there's some problem that we can't hear you. But anyway, let's look at a few others here. Uh, it looks like we may... Ah, we have uh, Joe with us. Uh, hello. Oh, Joe, you're on the air. Uh, yeah, I've listened to you talk about the Bible, and uh, I think what's more needful, you know, instead of trying to quiz people on how much you know about the Bible, 
it would be more in line with Jesus' teaching is to show how much you know about the scriptures by how you uh, demonstrate and live your life, is my opinion. Well, Joe, tell me something. How, 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 do, how do you know what to do if you don't know what it says? Yeah, but the point is, if you, if you run around trying to quiz people on how much they know, then you're setting yourself up as an authority. we got a guy by the name of Camping who runs around telling everybody that the world's coming to an end and look how big a fool he looked like when he sits there and gives everybody advice. So the idea is not to set yourself up as an authority, but as the scriptures teach you, to set an example on how you live your life. That's true religion by helping people without broadcasting what you're doing. So, you know, I go to church every Sunday and we get in these lessons and people start saying, oh, do you know this? Do you know that? That's not the way I think that the scripture should be taught. Joe, why, you why did you demonstrate Joe. in a manner Hello, of Joe. Uh, And that educates Joe. people want anything else, I think. Joe, uh, tell me something. Why, why would the Bereans called more noble than those of Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17? I'm having trouble hearing you, but say it again. In Acts chapter 17, uh -huh. it says that the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica. Why? Uh, it's very basic. Thing. Because they searched the scriptures. Uh, right. The, the Pharisees, uh, they were concerned with uh, putting on an outward show of morality for people. They, they, they tithed. They prayed. Uh, they they were you know very scrupulous about uh, what they ate. They were scrupulous about you know all their morals and things like that. And yet, do you also remember we, the, the woman came and was going to put the, the the lotion on Jesus's feet, and uh, the woman mm -hmm. came up and said, "Hey, uh, you're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath day or something." And you're, you're conflating two different things. This is more needful right now. So. You're, you're, I think that's my point. Joe, God Almighty has spoken to us. Are we, to, are, are we not to, to study the scriptures and know Him? Are we not? I mean, why were these things written yeah, down for us? We can't us? be legalistic about everything. We can't. What have I said that's legalistic? Judge people because they don't know a scripture. Joe. You know, the, the scriptures are, there's a lot, you know, if you're a Mormon like I am, how many scriptures are there? Joe. And, uh, you know, it takes a lifetime to learn all those scriptures. Joe, if you so, read, the, if you you read them... You judge people by that. Joe, if we you would... You need to judge them by, by how they... They're, they're, uh, if, if we do study the scriptures and the Spirit comes in our lives, the Holy Ghost will uh, give us the comfort of knowing, you know, when you get the Holy Ghost around you, there's a loving Spirit. There's a happy spirit. When I got baptized, that made a mistake on the program, and instead of baptized by the Holy Ghost, they put baptized by the Golly Ghost. And that's what I feel with, that when the Spirit's raptured, there's a joyous time. All right. That's what you have to make people feel when you're around them. And, Joe, you, get, you, and you, you can't force people to do things. You Joe, can only persuade them. And that's the secret Joe. of the gospel. Hello, Joe. Hello, gospel, Hello, Joe. You have to be able to persuade Joe, I'm going to have to cut you off here if you don't stop. Them, Joe. You have to feel comfortable. Joe, can, are you going to listen to me now? Or are you going to yeah, keep go talking? Ahead, Joe, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the essence of what you seem to be saying, and please hear me out, we're almost out of time here. The essence, I'm going to hang up okay. my phone's squealing. I'll okay. see you on the TV. All right. Joe, I'm not trying. I'm, I'm not trying to judge your heart. I'm not trying to do. Uh, I'm not trying to give you uh, an unnecessary hard time. But in essence, what you're saying is, God has spoken. So what? I don't really have time to worry about what God says. I'm going to be what I feel is right. Now the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. It says that the way there is a way that seems right to a man. And the end thereof is death. But hey, don't worry about that. Don't worry about uh, when Jesus says in Matthew 7, 
Many will come to me that, in that day and say, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? They're all excited. Lord, look at what we've done. We're your people. And Jesus says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. They are deceived to the point of judgment, and they go to hell. Joe, your soul and the souls of your children and the souls of your grandchildren depend on whether you take God seriously or not. And when God has given you his word and you don't bother to read it and study it as if your soul and your life and everything in, in all eternity depends on it, God help you. But that's what I hear all the time. Oh, I, I live a good life. I'm a moral person. Pharisees were convinced they were too. I'm not setting myself up as an authority. I'm not, this isn't, being right with God is not some uh, quiz. But it does, depend whether, it does matter whether you're worshiping the real God or not. And all you have to do is read this for a little while and you find out this isn't the God of Joseph Smith. Unfortunately, I don't have time to qualify all this uh, because we've reached the end of our time here. Um, there are LDS who are far more moral than many who claim to believe the truth, and yet they don't know God. Read the Bible for yourself. Don't take my word or anyone else's word. We invite you to worship with us Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church. We're a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. We have a sister congregation that meets at 3350 Harrison Boulevard at 9 a.m. in Ogden. Our worship times are 11 a.m. and uh, 5.30 p.m. Uh, if you'd like more information, you can go to www.christpres.net or give us a call at 801-969-7948. Till next time, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night. Yeah.